thank you for the invitation to talk to the department this morning or this afternoon, I should say. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me. So uh, Matt suggested that I give a little overview to begin with of my career uh, as it's evolved. And that sort of will set the scene for then the talk that I give afterwards. So very uh, briefly, when I get my next slide up, we did try this earlier, of course, and it did work. Here we go. So the early years, as I call it, uh, I did a BSc in physiology in Belfast in Northern Ireland, where I'm from. Uh, and then I went on to do a PhD because I was enjoying uh, that topic so much. When I got the PhD then, I was fortunate enough to move straight to the USA. I got a what's called a JDF, which is Juvenile Diabetes Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship, which allowed me to go to Penn State. And at that point in time, Penn State had just opened up a new medical school, uh, which was in was 100 kilometers away from the main university campus in a town called Hershey. And for those who have been to the States, you'll associate that with chocolate. So there was a medical school, there was a chocolate factory, and there was an amusement park in Hershey. But it was a wonderful place, and I had a great time over the next three years. However, I decided that I wasn't going to uh, spend the rest of my time in the USA, and I was going to come back to Europe. So I was fortunate enough then to get an MRC, a Medical Research Council postdoc position, back at the University of Sussex on the south coast in England. And that was an interesting time because uh, it was sort of uh, decision time for me. I, I wanted to stay in academia, but I wasn't sure whether I would be able to. And the other choice was obviously to go towards industry. So I gave myself a year to find an academic uh, lectureship post. And I was fortunate enough to do that. I got what was called a new blood lectureship at the time at the University of Southampton. And that was really where I got heavily into free radical biology, which was, which was a new topic at the time. And uh, there was a lots of room for, for work. And, and my particular approach was to try and, and link it into disease processes, which will be the basis of this talk today. In 1992, then I was I moved. I was headhunted. And I moved to uh, St Thomas's Hospital in London, uh, where I stayed for the next eight years, progressing through the ranks, the academic ranks. Uh, in 2000, with my increasing interest around the effects of air quality on health, I took up a new position, the Professor of uh, Environmental uh, Health. And that really then uh, set the scene for the next uh, 20 years of my work and really during the time that I became familiar with, with Matt and his uh, activities as well. But during uh, 2020, in fact, uh, on the 1st of April, so at the very beginning of the lockdown in the UK due to the pandemic, I moved from, Imper uh, from King's College to Imperial College and the reason I did that was because Imperial had developed this new campus in West London at White City. And it's an absolutely fantastic new facility. I was offered uh, a whole floor on the new Sir Michael Uren building that you can see there in the middle uh, with bespoke facilities for the type of work that we do. So we've got clean rooms, we've got aerosol science laboratories, we've got good cell culture facilities, and we've got weighing rooms, etc. So very, very nice uh, facilities for the team to move over to. And that's where we're now located. So moving on to the topic of, of today's talk, which is really around air quality and its effects on health. So why is this important? Well, if we look at the Global Burden of Disease project, and this was the 2019 update, you can see on this graph that Air pollution, and that's both indoors and outdoor exposure to air pollution, is ranked as the fourth uh, important influencer on, on health. And this is, in fact, loss of life expectancy in this graph. And you can see that on average across the world, poor air quality is, is uh, related to a loss of nearly two years of, of life. But of course, that varies from you know a few days in some people up to 10 years in other people, depending on that on their location. The other reason I think that air pollution 
uh, research uh, is not only strong at the moment, but will get stronger, is because it's it has strong links with climate change. And we all know that that is, you know, an increasingly uh, researched area. It's going to affect the whole world over the next, you know, probably 50, 60 years in respect of how we change as society. So both climate change and air quality is influenced heavily by fossil fuel burning. And so the two are interlinked. Uh, and as a consequence, I think you will be hearing a lot more about air pollution. So just to remind you, we're exposed to a whole range of different air pollutants uh, from a whole range of different sources. So on the top left here, you can see the, uh, the transport sectors, you know, an important component of that exposure scenario. Energy generation is as well, as is agriculture, both from a, you know, a primary emissions climate change viewpoint and from a secondary particulate uh, air quality viewpoint. But there are also other sources as well, uh, which, you know, are increasingly important, such as shipping and microenvironments, such as the underground. But we're going to talk about particles today, and air, conta air contains many different types of particles. There's man-made ones, uh, anthropogenic ones, such as diesel suit and, and metal particles coming from various industries. But there's also a lot of natural ones, such as aeroallergens and desert dust, such as from the Sahara and sea salt. And so when we breathe in PM pollution, we're breathing in a mixture of these. And that mixture will, will change depending on our location. And again, this makes it very challenging when you're actually trying to link uh, exposure to particulate pollution and health outcomes because of that mixture. And A, you need to understand the mixture that the individual just breathing, uh, both in the short term and in the long term. As well as the different types of particles, then the particles of different sizes. And again, this is important because really we're only interested in anything that's less than 10 microns in diameter, because that means it can enter the respiratory tract. It can get into our lungs. And the smaller the particle is, the further it will go into our lungs, the deeper it will go. And just to put that into context here, uh, this is a human hair. It's usually around 60 microns in diameter. And so you can, you could lure up what, 10 of these PM10 particles, or sorry, six of these 10, six of these PM10 particles across a human hair, or 24 of this other type PM2.5. And then when you get down to the ultrafine range, you know, less than 100 nanometers, then of course you're talking about uh, hundreds if not thousands of particles. So traditionally we've linked poor quality particulate pollution with a whole range of respiratory diseases such as asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung cancer, etc. But increasingly, I would say probably starting about 15 years ago, we're linking poor air quality with a whole range of other diseases beyond the lung. Uh, and this is illustrated here really in this graph, and it's a nice graph, nice graph that came from this report, Royal College of Physicians and Royal College of Pediatrics back in 2016. And basically what they were indicating was that there's a wide threat to human health from poor air pollution, poor air quality, and the effects occur across the lifespan. So there are effects on the unborn child. Uh, we know that, uh, Particular pollution has been found in the placenta, and the placenta is key in getting nutrients and oxygen to that child. So it's not surprising that in some areas of the world, you see lower birth weight uh, where there's higher pollution. We also have problems uh, with children growing up. Uh, they tend to have developmental problems. Uh, they tend to be have more respiratory problems such as wheeze, etc which may develop into asthma subsequently uh, in, in teenage years. And we know from work that's been done in California and in London and, and China now, that in fact, kids who are bringing, who are breathing in uh, air quality of, of inadequate uh, nature actually end up having slower development of their lungs. And this is critical then uh, as they get older uh, if they end up with a, a smaller lung function than they should have. Uh, 
And then, of course, in adulthood, we've got a whole range of diseases that's been linked with poor air quality, uh, from asthma through to type 2 diabetes and heart attacks, etc. And then finally, we don't even escape it in our old age because the, the, the issues around uh, dementia and cognitive decline now have been linked into poor air quality across the, across the lifespan as well. So it, it really is uh, an issue which affects all of us in different ways and at different times in our, in our life. And that's why it's really important to do something about poor air quality uh, so we can improve health. Now, this has been brought into uh, the spotlight really in the last two weeks because there are guidelines for air quality. Uh, and here's the different, uh, different types of main pollutants, NO2, nitrogen dioxide, two types of PM, 2.5 and 10, and the other gas, ozone. And the, 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 uh, the last set of guidelines that we had to work with for the last 15 years were published in 2005. But two weeks ago, they were updated, the 2021 guidelines. And these have really changed. So you can see that NO2, which used to be 40 micrograms per meter cubed, has fallen down to 10 micrograms per meter cubed as a, as a guideline. And PM2.5 has halved from 10 to 5. And these are really quite small concentrations of, of pollution uh, that the WHO are saying that we need to uh, achieve if we're not going to have the health effects that we're seeing across the world. So major challenges for, for lots of countries here to try and meet these in due course. So here's the crux of the, the lecture really, or the talk. Uh, it's, it's what is it about the particles? What, what nature, uh, is it their size? Is it the number of particles we're exposed to? Uh, is it where they're coming from, their source? Uh, because that could relate to their chemical composition, uh, which may indicate their reactivity. Uh, we know that weather is important for distributing the pollution and, and, can, and can distribute it uh, farther away or can concentrate it. Uh, when we start getting inside the body, then is it the solubility of the particles that's important? Uh, maybe releasing some of the toxic components that they carry. Is it primary particles or secondary particles which are most important? Is it their shape, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of issues that we can consider when we're addressing this issue, what's really important when you're considering particle toxicity. Because ultimately we're gonna to get to a point where we are gonna have extreme difficulty bringing air quality to the level of five micrograms per meter cubed. And what we really want to do is understand what's really the important sources and hit those, because then we'll be getting, you know, removing the most health affecting components of the particles. But this is a really, really difficult challenge. And people have been trying to meet this at least for the last decade. So I've got here, it represents one of the most uh, challenging areas of environmental health research, and it really has promoted momentous research efforts in the past. There have been large projects funded by the Health Effects Institute in the USA. Uh, there's been work undertaken by the uh, WHO, for example, around black carbon, and there's a whole range of other studies which are out there in the primary literature. And to, just to give you a flavor of, of, of the, the challenge I'm talking about, this was a major study uh, which funded by the HEI, uh, the, the National, National Particle uh, Component Initiative uh, back in 2013. And you can see it says here, the studies do not provide compelling evidence that any specific source component size class of PM may be excluded as a possible contributor to PM toxicity. Now this was after about five years work multiple teams working on the project, uh, probably best part of a couple of million dollars. And this was the conclusion. We still can't, we still can't put our finger on what's really, really important. The, uh, there was another study published around that time as well. And you can see here, uh, the conclusion of it is associations with a given PM chemical component uh, should be considered as potentially indicative of associations with another component. Uh, or, or set of components with a similar uh, sources. So what they're saying is everything's 
everything's linked together, you know, from a particular source. So it's really difficult to pull out a component from that source and say it it is the, you know, the important thing. We just can't do that at this point in time. But that's that's really the the bad news in respect of the you know the lack of progress. I want to give you a little bit of uh, good news, and that was some work we were involved in in, in very early days. But th the questions that we started was around PM toxicity. What is it we we don't fully understand? So I put it this way: Are all particles equally active, and where does the toxicity reside? And in particular. To what extent are tailpipe derived particles responsible for the health effects observed? And I, I zoned in on that particular question because a lot of the epidemiology was, was sort of pointing towards traffic emissions as being particularly uh, important from a health viewpoint. So what we did was we, uh, we started thinking about the, the chemistry of the, 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 uh, the traffic emissions. So whether they were particles, PM, or nitrogen dioxide, we realize that they have potentially free radical activity, either as a, a radical themselves, as NO2 is, or from the transition metals that the PM carries on its surface. Ozone is another uh, gas. It's not a free radical, but it's a very, very strong oxidant. So it can basically oxidize anything uh, it comes in contact with. So it, it came to mind that all these pollutants, these primary pollutants, really were probably at least initially interacting through free radical reactions or oxygen biology. And we were encouraged to go down this line when further work demonstrated that the lung, and we're talking about from the nose right down to the deep lung, is lined with a layer of fluid. And this is an electron micrograph here that, that is taken in a very special way, which retains all the fluid characteristics of the sample. And what we have here on one side is the alveolus, which is where the air is. On the other side, we have the capillary, where the, it's waiting, the red blood cells are waiting to pick up the oxygen on hemoglobin. And we have this long wall, which is made up of the endothelial cell, a basement membrane, and a type one epithelial cell. So that traditionally was the lung barrier or the lung wall, but this electron micrograph also has this other compartment, which is a fluid compartment, which sits on the outside of the lung. And that's what I've been talking about. It's called the respiratory tract lining fluid or the lung lining fluid. And when techniques became available, uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy, where you could actually put a, a bronchoscope down into the lung, and retain uh, again some of the uh, samples of this lung lining fluid, uh, we were able to take that sample to the laboratory and analyze what was in it. Now we knew that there was surfactant as the primary uh, lipid in there, and there's lots of proteins, but what we found was there were very high concentrations of antioxidants, small molecular weight antioxidants. So uric acid, uh, reduced glutathione, and ascorbic acid. And these are very good at, uh, at defending us against free radicals. So when we put together our oxidants from the pollution side, our antioxidants sitting on the surface of the lung, we thought, you know, this is an interesting thing to uh, investigate further. So what we did was we came up with this working hypothesis where we, uh, we were working on the idea that the particles were bringing in oxidant mole uh, uh, driving molecules such as uh, transition metals, they would enter this layer of fluid where they would naturally react with the antioxidants that were present there. And as a consequence, under normal circumstances, this particle would become less oxidant as it moved across the fluid layer. Uh, but at the same time, through these sacrificial reactions, you would get a decrease in the concentration of these antioxidants. And so over many, many years research, we, we sort of ended up demonstrating that, yes, this is the sort of thing that goes on. But we also used this knowledge to actually go out back into the environment to try and answer that question about particle toxicity, because we thought this could be a test bed in, in a 
artificial situation where we have lung lining fluid full of its antioxidant defenses. We collect PM from different sources and we bring them together and we use the depletion of the antioxidants as our measure of the oxygen activity of the particles. So we did that in London in a, a, an experiment back, as you can see, many years ago now. And what we did was we went out to all our different monitoring sites and we collected PM from them over a period of time. And then we brought them into an assay where we had the lung lining fluid. And this graph is showing us the depletion of glutathione, an important antioxidant, uh, against just the, uh, the presence of the same concentration of particles from all these different sites. And simply what I'm showing you is the sites are divided into two categories by color. And the ones which are in this uh, bluish sort of color, as opposed to those in this greenish sort of color, maybe it's not surprising to you, certainly wouldn't be if you've read the paper. These are from roadside monitoring sites and these are from background monitoring sites. So there was something about the nature of the particles collected at roadside, which had more oxygen activity than those that were collected at background, which basically had been roadside plus everything else all diluted together. And you can see that as by the loss, the increased loss of glutathione uh, from the assay. So that's what sort of set up this hypothesis that there's something about the oxygen capacity of the pollution we're breathing, which ends up over time injuring the cells either in the lung or beyond the lung, which leads to disease process. And I'm summarizing that in this sort of next cartoon. So here's all our environmental pollutants. Uh, we've got oxidative stress. Uh, we've got antioxidant depletion. We, uh, in some, depending, you can imagine this is a balance, depending on your antioxidants on one side and the amount of pollution you're breathing in, you know, one, in one situation, the antioxidants are going to win and in another situation, the pollutants are going to win. And it, when the pollutants win, then we get signals being generated, which leads to inflammation in the lung, uh, which leads to a second wave of oxidative stress because our neutrophils produce free radicals to kill bacteria, etc. And then, as I said to you earlier, we initially just thought about the lung, but now we think about every other organ in the body being affected. So obviously this had to go beyond the lung. And we think this is through the signaling process of these uh, various uh, cytokines, et cetera, which go into the systemic circulation, and affect the vasculature elsewhere, and, and maybe even cells and tissues else, elsewhere, such as the heart. So that's the very basic mechanism. Now, what I want to move on, because we're, we're getting near the end of the, the presentation, I want to give time for questions, but what I want to move on to is that things are changing. So if you're, you know, at the early part of your career, then a lot of what I've been dealing with is not what you would be dealing with if you moved into this area of research, because we've got, <clears throat> we're getting rid of tailpipe emissions uh, from, through electric vehicle penetration into fleets. But what we're left with is non-exhaust PM. So coming from brakes and tires and road wear. And work that has been done to date on that is demonstrating that in fact, it's just as bad, if not worse, than the tailpipe emissions we were dealing with before. So that really needs to be understood further. And, and we need to get some changes in here to influence that. Another big area of interest to us is around microplastics. Now you've heard about the plastics in the ocean, plastics in the water. We now know the plastic particles and fibers are in the air that we're breathing. And we now have technology which has allowed us to go down to below 10 microns in size. So we know that there are microplastics which we're breathing in as part of modern uh, life. If you just think about furniture, carpets, uh, even tires, these are all plastic these days. And so we, we're a plastic generation. So we, we have this new PM challenge and we don't really know what the health effects, potential health effects may be associated with that. And then maybe some, but certainly not, and especially domestic wood burning, wood stoves, 
is the biggest source of PM pollution that we have. It's a pop that looks nice, feels good, and uh, it might turn out to be uh, a problem for us as well. Now, I'm just going to whiz through some of these slides because of time. Uh, but there is a question we're now investigating. Are inhalable microplastics affecting our health? And you can imagine all the sort of work that has to be done to, to, to answer that question going forward. So again, that's a big area, you know, that other people may have before them uh, as part of their careers. Uh, with fossil, because there is occupational uh, lung disease there where people have been working with uh, fibres. There's a flocker work, worker's lung, which uh, has been, uh, NIOSH has sort of been working on for a number of years now, and it says the health hazard exists for occupational exposure flockers. So it is possible, but of course the concentration issue here is going to be important, the exposure issue. Uh, domestic wood burning. This is, this is the last slide, I think. This is back climate change. So, you know, we may have dealt with a lot of the emissions and we did them in our urban areas. But of course, you've heard over the last few years, we have these new sources depending on location. I mean, if you're in California or Australia, there's terrible wildfires producing lots of particulate pollution affecting communities across those places. And of course, as well, there's sandstorms. I mean, Beijing had this earlier this year, it had a week where you couldn't see beyond the length of your arm because of sand that was coming down from the Gobi Desert. So these natural, shall we say, and anthropogenic uh, sources of particles will be mixing in with all the other sources which we talked about earlier. And again, that 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 impact on our health is totally unknown uh, and potentially, you know, challenging. So again, there's lots and lots of work to do around that area, which will be linked into the climate change agenda. So uh, this is my penultimate slide, uh, going back to what the heck do we need to deal with to get rid of PM toxicity if, if we just can't get rid of all the PM? We still don't know. So you know, I've worked on it for 20 plus years now. We've made some progress, but there's still, there's still a lot of investigation to be done. And I just want to finish by some acknowledgements. Ian Mudway, who's worked with me since his PhD and is now a team lead in the group, has done an awful lot of the oxidative biology work. Thomas Sandstrom and Anders Bloomberg and Umeå in, in northern Sweden, where we've done a lot of exposure chamber work investing in this. And Fleming Cassis and Bert Brunekreff in the Netherlands, again, have been uh, close researchers. But there's a whole list which would fill several slides of other great people who have worked with us over the years. And uh, my thanks goes out to everyone. So thank you very much. And over to you, Matt.